um, of unanticipated parallel universe that's going to go by very fastly of a development plan that um, complements but is independent of uh, vaccine development. So this is everything we know how to do on this planet to prevent HIV, and all our aspirations are on one slide. And <clears throat> I'll make it just a couple of points in the slide. One is that this idea of, of safer sex behavior, we kind of dismiss it pretty quickly. Most of us are biologists, but the point is we have no idea how, this, how big this epidemic would be had we not tried to get people to have safer sex, treated STDs, circumcised millions of young and adolescent men and so on and so forth. So, and uh, kind of behavior change is going to be required for whatever else we do, whether we have a vaccine or don't have a vaccine. So I'm not gonna talk about it more, but realize within the prevention trials network, the partner in parallel universe to the vaccine network, a lot of time is spent on what we might be able to do about human behavior as it relates to interventions. I'm gonna talk about just two things really. I'm gonna talk mostly about antiretroviral agents and their two ways we might use them for treatment, which is their God-given right, and that's how we mostly use them, and then uh, antiretrovirals for prevention. I'm going to talk, I talk really, really fast. Most Americans cannot understand me. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk, and Francois is shaking his head, yes, he's never understood a lecture I gave. I'm going to try and talk a little bit slower uh, today on purpose, so I apologize. So the, the, basic, the basic idea in HIV prevention as it relates to treatment is this axiomatic issue, and that is most people are in a relationship, uh, whether it's sexual or sharing drugs or whatever, and it is axiomatic that when you treat the infected person, they, they are no longer contagious. And that, the treatment is long, and, and so suppression leads to lack of contagion at a level that I don't believe that we would have anticipated until lots of studies were done, both in gay couples and straight couples. Um, in fact, the kind of negative is as follows. Proving the negative is very difficult. This very famous quote from this guy makes the point that sometimes the negative becomes true. In the HIV field, there is there are no cases of HIV transmission from someone who's been suppressed, which is quite incredible, because for 20 years, people are looking for a suppressed person who transmitted HIV, and there are literally no cases that have been defined. So this is our axiomatic belief. This led to the campaign Larry mentioned already, which is quite important for stigma, the U equals U campaign. The importance of this campaign is so that people get tested, and once they're tested and treated, they, they look at their lives as one pill a day normal life and aren't considering themselves so stigmatized that they avoid testing, because in the absence of testing, we have no chance of treating more people uh, to both for their own benefit and for getting around the epidemic. Larry alluded to um, the four population level community randomized studies that were done to try and understand. So at, at, the, at the individual couple level, we're 100% sure that when you treat somebody, if they remain on their treatment, they are not contagious. But at the population level, we, have no, we had no idea of the magnitude of benefit we could see. So four different studies were done. These are community randomized where you take one community and you more rapidly treat people. You take another community and you, you leave them as undisturbed as you can. Four studies were published, and as, as indicated, um, the maximal benefit was about 30% from treating massive number of people. Now, this was not a surprise to the investigators for a whole bunch of reasons that if you want to discuss it more, we can discuss it later in much more detail. But what's important is, as we were doing these trials, we always anticipated that the benefit would be modest and that we would need tools or metrics to understand the limitations to the study. So I'm just going to say a few words about the tools that were inserted that where we'll have results this summer and beyond of what the limits are to the benefit so we can better target our intervention to get a benefit closer to 50, 60, 70 percent, which is a goal. So in summary, on this slide, treatment serves as prevention, but it's imperfect. Now, the, the HPT, HIV Prevention Trials Network 071, also called POPART, that was the biggest study. That, that assessed treatment as prevention in 1.2 million people in Zambia and South Africa. So it's a massive study. What's important here is that in the communities in Zambia, we collected lots of samples from molecular phylogeny. So phylogeny was always going to be a metric that was going to inform us as to limits on, of the study itself. The basic idea, we, the, the technique we use is managed at Oxford called PhiloScanner, and PhiloScanner is a deep sequencing method that in, in a very cheap $30 a sample tells us a rough estimate of viral load, a pretty good estimate of resistance, but it also gives us molecular epidemiology that we can use to understand why we're not seeing more benefit within these communities, and I'll be very specific in a second. 
we use phylogeography a lot. So if we have the sample and the GPS coordinates, we know where the person is that's infected and where their sequence ought to be. And when their sequence shows up somewhere else, we can identify that it is where it's not supposed to be. We'll call that. And there's a language that surrounds this called sinks and sources. The sinks are where viruses disappear. The sources are the sources of new viruses. This is from Diego Quadro, who's one of the um, phylogeographists that are he's in, uh, working on this. But what's important is that the Gates Foundation supports a collaboration called Pangea. And Pangea is designed to look at sequences in Africa and better relate all these sequences and develop new methods to understand the limits of what we're trying to do absent a vaccine. Um, so this is just an example of like the hotspot idea. That, oops, the hotspot idea is that you can see places where sequences exist that are emanating from that place. And that's the place where you would want to be more aggressive with your treatment, if that makes sense. So you know, you're, you're looking for place as much as you're looking for people. So in our assessment, so as I've already indicated, this summer at the IAS meeting, we will assess the strengths and weaknesses of the, of the um, uh, POPAR trial. And in that assessment, we'll try and identify limitations to success. These are some of the limitations. Was there, were, was there excessive resistance to the treatments that were offered? And I can warn you already that resistance is a problem in some of these 21 communities. So maybe people got on treatment that was not effective. That's one possibility. Untreated people are the biggest problem. So we've only treated so many people in that community. The untreated people include, first of all, and most important, people with acute infection, because we have not identified them, and we know they're probably most contagious. Second, in migration, we identify already that sequences are coming from communities that have nothing to do with community we're, treated, we're treating. So therefore, as people come into that community untreated, they can contaminate, that's the epi word, contaminate the community and continue transmission. Um, and then most important, what, what you're going to see in the next five years in this field is an in intense focus on young men, on treating young men. It's very clear that for a whole bunch of reasons, young women have been the focus of attention because they end up getting health care. Because of prenatal visits and pregnancy, they get health care, but the young men who transmit HIV to the young women never get health care and avoid health care. What will come out this summer, and this is for Glenda specifically, what will come out this summer is that the age discrepancies are not exactly as the Caprisa group reported. The age discrepancies have been much better defined and refined, and so there'll be an intense effort on treating young men to improve treatment as prevention. So these are the strategies towards treatment as prevention. So now I'm going to switch gears completely. So that's where we are. Treat more people. Find, detect people, treat them, and move forward. The 90-90-90 campaign is now 95-95-95. The benefit, and this campaign will not stop. It will go on, and that's where we are. Now, the alternative universe is that we could provide something to people who are HIV negative. Larry's already alluded to the possibility of providing them an antibody, and, and that seems highly desirable. The alternative, of course, is obvious the antibody has to compete with antiretrovirals of many flavors and to be used in ever better fashion. So the first of these is Truvada, TDF-FTC, and that drug was really proved remarkable that a pill a day could so profoundly prevent the acquisition of HIV. I don't think that was really anticipated. It's better studied in men than it is in women. But it's, it, and it's very resistant to the inflammation caused by STDs because half the people on Truvada go ahead and get an STD during the course of their Truvada therapy, and the, they resist STDs, which is incredible. And that, that's true for Truvada. It hasn't been proven for any of the other drugs we're studying. Truvada will probably be replaced by a combination of uh, the tenofovir alphenamide and, and FTC, um, and FDA approval is pending on that combination. But it's still a pill a day or a few pills a week. Uh, some, some European countries have approved a uh, 2 one 2 regimen and these other regimens, but in the United States, it remains a pill a day. Now, here's the problem on one slide. And, when you start somebody on pre-exposure prophylaxis currently, Truvada pre-exposure prophylaxis, there is no end put in front of the patient. It's not like malaria prophylaxis. It's, well, here's this stuff. Take it forever, maybe. And that's not very satisfying because then people don't take it at all. And so what happens is the people who continue to take Truvada are now called PrEP persisters. And the reason they're call, called PrEP persisters is because so many stop PrEP once they start taking it. Now, in all candor, this has been to the advantage of clinical trials, in a sense, because 
if PrEP is part of a prevention package and people take it so infrequently and so irregularly, we can still assess whether a, a some other intervention works. But if people really use their PrEP faithfully, it would be very difficult to assess any other intervention. So on that, on that slide, you just see people discontinuing, discontinuing, discontinuing. And so the field has decided, okay, there must be an alternative to a pill. Let's give some sort of a thing that's not a pill. And so the thing that is very popular, that's gotten very far, and again, it's got a 2020 answer pending, or maybe before, is the injectable agent cabotegravir. This is a nano suspension of an of a, a, a integrase inhibitor. Um, and it, it doesn't, the cabotegravir drug does not have a long half-life. It's, it's delivered to the gluteus, uh, to the fat around the gluteus, and once it gets in there, it's a depot drug. So it's not that it lasts a long time, it's that it, it lasts because it's um, sitting in a, in a cavity in a, in a, in a hunk of fat. Um, a study was done that's been, that was published to show how, um, kind of the safety and the dose we should use called HPTN 077. Another study has been completed and is submitted looking at both men and women and showing something actually quite important on the next slide. And that is what we call the tail of the injection. So this becomes important. When we give this stuff, the, the way the studies generally go, we do a run-in of a pill. The run-in of the pill is simply to prove that we can give an injection that we can't get out that may, won't harm the host, right? If, if there's a side effect from the pill, we would never give the shot because we can't get any of the material out once we inf inject it. And in this slide, what you see is, sorry, in this slide what you see is uh, 60 weeks and 70 weeks and men and women and what I want to emphasize to you is, and, and we don't know the dose that's protective. Again, it's the correlates of protection. We have no idea the actual correlate of protection. We know something about what antiviral is necessary to treat a person with cabotegravir, but we don't really know what's required to prevent. And what happens is this drug stays around a year or 15 months or two years. So once it's in, it's going to be there a long time. That's good and bad. For the first three or four months, look, maybe people are protected far greater than the eight-week window that we're using, but then after a year or 15 months, maybe they don't want the drug in their blood anymore. Now, we have no reason to believe it harms the host, but this tail is important. The other point about the tail is that as the drug concentration wanes, if people remain sexually active and at risk for exposure to HIV, then during the tail period, they've got a sub-therapeutic concentration, and they, we may force resistance to integrase inhibitors, and that would be a bad, bad thing. So then we call it covering the tail. Now somebody's off their injections, and now they have to take Truvada for a year to cover the tail. As you can see, this is undesirable, and this is what makes antibodies more attractive, Larry, you'll be very glad to know, that because we don't suffer the tail phenomenon to the same extent we do for the antiretrovirals. Now, cabotegravir has been combined with ropivirine as a therapeutic agent, an injection to be given every eight weeks, most likely, every eight weeks, and that drug is, does anyone know what that drug is called? I'm about to reveal the name. Does anybody want to know the name of this drug? Okay, Cabonuva. That's the name of this drug, Cabonuva. And I didn't make up the name, so don't shoot the messenger. So Cabonuva, Cabonuva will be released as a therapeutic agent probably in the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year, and we have no idea how many HIV-infected people are going to want to go on Cabonuva as an alternative to um, their current very successful antiviral regimens. Okay, so cabotegravir, we know it lasts a long time and we know the dose, and like with the AMP studies, we are doing two giant trials, but unlike the AMP studies, these are licensure trials. And these two trials are a collaboration between Viv and Glaxo, the Gates Foundation, and NIH, because they're very expensive and very time consuming. One trial is in men called HBTN 083, and that's run by a guy named Rafi Landovitz. And the, another trial is in women in sub Saharan Africa, that's 084, and that's a trial run by a woman named Beatrice Grinstein in, uh, I'm sorry, by Shanae uh, Delaney at University of Witwatersrand. Rand. Uh, the, the, the men's study, and, and the trials are identical. You have a, a pill for a month, not because you need the pill, that's a safety maneuver. These pills will go away after 30 or 40,000 people have received the drug. Then you get the drug, and then, you, then, then in the third phase of the trial, you're off the drug, but you need to cover the tail. And so then we have to follow people a whole additional year after the trial's over to cover the tail. 083, the men's study in, in uh, the Americas, has 27 sites. In the United States, 11 South 
American sites, four Asian sites, one African site. This study is fully enrolled with uh, 4,500 men, and we're, um, we may enroll additional men for a variety of reasons. Uh, so that study is fully enrolled. The women's site is estimated to have 3,200 women uh, who have sex with men and transgender, and uh, the men's study has transgendered men. The women's study is only women, 18 to 45, and that study has uh, 2,700 women enrolled. That study will be fully enrolled within the next few months. Now, to never to disagree with Larry is one of the premises of this meeting. However, there is, there is a, a safety. We, we, all the results are overseen every six months, and November 5th, we have our, our oversight of safety for this study as well as the AMP studies, and so we may hear from either of those studies on November 5th. I doubt if, we'll, if the Cabotegavir prevention studies will stop November 5th, but it's possible, and, and we'll see what we learn about the AMP studies. Now, for the, the study, for this, by the way, can you understand me at this rate of talking speed, Francois? All right, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm limited by need to breathe. Um, so so in, this, in this study, uh, first of all, recruitment and retention, unlike the AMP study, the AMP study has tremendous altruism that we barely understand. People are part of a team that's quite remarkable. This study has far more recruitment and retention problems. Why is that? Well, in the AMP study, we're giving a, a beautiful infusion with a lovely healthcare worker in your arm, one little st stick, and you're sitting there eating cookies for a half an hour. But in, in the in the Cabotegavir studies, you're getting two gigantic shots um, and that are that are not that pleasant. So I mean, just right off the bat, the negative incentive of the of the volume of fluid that's going into the buttocks is not something people look forward to. So the, so the dropout rate is, is considerable for in, injections. Um, we don't know if the STDs will overwhelm CAB-LA prep. It's called cabotegravir long-acting. Um, we have a problem with intention to treat versus as treated, which I'll get into if people really want to talk about trial design, but it's a pretty big issue that you really need to think about. And then lastly, something really important, and that is, Every trial we're doing, whether it's the monoclonals or, or um, cabotegravir, is compromised by our treating more and more people. Exposure from a treated person is a safe exposure. So as communities that we're studying have more and more treatment, the probability of an exposure is very, very small. Now look at, let me give you the most specific example. Look at the um, uh, Gilead's v, um, Discover study. They, they were going to do a study in men who have sex with men and see 120 roughly incident events. They, all, they, they saw 17 incident events in that population. Now, it could be because their drug works great, but more likely the populations that they're studying are communities where so many people get treated that exposures are safer and safer. So the good news is we're treating more and more people. But the people who end up going in trials might be living in communities where exposure becomes not so risky because of the treatment issue. Okay. So let's move to the, now, so this, this is where we are, Truvada, but let's move beyond Truvada at other drugs that we are committed to studying in the next five years and different methods by which those drugs might be delivered. Probably the most important of these is the NNRTI MK8591, now called Islatravir, made by Merck, and that, that's a drug that's so potent that it kind of a, a Lilliputian dosage, a smidgen of this drug is effective. So because of its potency, it, it, they can give a fairly large amount, and it has a tremendously long half-life when they give a fairly large amount. And they're doing a study, a safety study, a once-a-month study. They obviously want this to be a therapeutic drug. They need to find a once-a-month partner. They don't have a once-a-month partner yet. This drug, when given at different doses to animals, protects animals from HIV infection. So therefore, this drug becomes a potential really important HIV prevention agent, whether it's given orally once a month or Merck has a whole other idea. Now, wh what would Merck's other idea be? What does Merck really make and sell a lot of? Birth control that is implanted. So right off the bat, a chemist that's a friend of mine named Stephanie Barrett, uh, I don't have a slide of her, Stephanie Barrett made an implant, um, and, and implants are of two kinds. Implants are of matrix and reservoir. 
Matrix means that the stuff is integrated into the, into the, into the implant. Reservoir means you got a big chamber and the, and the stuff is in the chamber. Matrix is more desirable. So Merck was able to make a matrix implant with uh, MK8591. And that's a really, really powerful stuff that I'll show you in a second. The other implants that are being developed are cabotegravir implant by Northwestern and Vive themselves. TAF implants, that, that's tenofovir alfinamide by several different companies. MK8591 I've already talked about, and then I'll, I'll show you a picture of a cell gel implant. Um, missing from this slide, one other thing, there are capsid inhibitors in very early development. They can last a very long time, but they're very early in development. Those are made by Gilead and other, and Vive, each have capsid inhibitors. This is a TAF implant, and it's a reservoir implant, and the advantage of this is it's got all these chambers, and you can reload it. So now you put this implant in, and then six months later, you can put a needle into it and reload it. But the problem is reservoirs can dump the product. Reservoir dumping would be a big issue if you have a really high concentration of drug in your blood, and that, that's a concern as you're developing these implants. The other point about tenofovir implant, uh, to alfinamate implant, is that this summer there's going to be a paper coming out that'll say that maybe it's not well tolerated in the soft tissue. There's a debate about this. Um, the investigators working with these implants say they're, they're doing great. Some other investigators say they're having some soft tissue issues, so we'll see what happens with that. This is the MK8591 eluding implant. They've gone to a, an animal model already, they just reported, and they can get this, it's a matrix implant, they know how to make it, they know how to put it in, and they can get a year of this MK8591 from the implant, eluded from the implant. So this is a big deal. This is like the cat's meow of, of prevention if they, can, if they can actually commercialize this. And if they can figure out how to do a clinical trial to prove this works, that's a whole other challenge. Now, I've only talked about matrix and reservoir implants. But there's a whole other world of patches and needles. So if on television at night, at least in the United States, they're endlessly advertising patches that go in your arm. Any, any implant drug, any of these drugs that are going implants can also go into a patch on your arm that have micro needles that penetrate the skin and deliver the drug. So there's a whole other movement to make a micro, micro needle patch prevention strategy for HIV. Now, and this is... Um, um, one other point here, though. So now the treatment as prevention part of this is a powerful tool to prevent HIV. But the PrEP idea, only 144,000 people on the whole planet are getting PrEP. In, in, in the best of worlds, maybe a million people will get PrEP. But it's very hard to see, and I'm not opposed to developing it. It has to be targeted. But you, the limitations at a public health level are very grave for something like PrEP especially given the current persistence issues and the rules. But I will say one thing to the people in this room. PrEP is a huge problem for clinical trials because the prevention package in clinical trials often has to include everything, including PrEP. And the people who volunteer for clinical trials, they're very likely to get PrEP. And if we have injectable PrEP, then it becomes an ethical issue of, of tremendous gravity because then you've got a drug that is not going to disappear that's not volitional, but they would prevent HIV. So we have to, I think as clinical trialists, we have to take into consideration this parallel universe I'm describing uh, as it relates to the vaccine field and the BNAB field. There is a whole other idea that the MIT people have worked on and now many groups are working on, that is uh, the physical structure of your drug. This is the cell gel idea. So my colleague Victor Garcia and, and our School of Pharmacy, they made um, a, a liquid dalutegravir, they, they made it in a formulation where they in, 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 inject it into an animal and it turns into a solid and the solid eludes drug forever. And you could get this lump. So the animal now has a lump and humans may not want a big lump under their skin. That I can't, I mean, that may not be something a human chooses, but the lump could be surgically removed. So if we're comparing the cabotegravir problem, if we never can get it out versus the lump that we can get out, the lump has a lot, of, a lot of momentum, and a lot of people have seen the cell gel idea. And as I said, the MIT people are working on a lot of different formulations like this. Okay, I just want to say one thing. So in summary, for the parallel universe, there are three things to say in summary. Number one, the parallel universe of prevention includes human behavior at every possible level, 
and that's a big pursuit of the prevention trials network. In addition, it requires targeting, something people hate to use that word, or focusing on populations at the greatest risk of either getting HIV or transmitting HIV. We, it is not credible to get the whole species involved. You know, there are clearly key populations at risk for acquisition and transmission. Um, the second point is in the biology of prevention without a vaccine, the things that we look at as credible include antivirals and broad neutralizing antibodies, and that's why we have our wonderful partnership with the VTN. Now, my only comment about Larry's comments, which were quite excellent, you'll be glad to know, is that, that this whole experiment, and Larry, Larry kind of got at this, what's really important here is the first four weeks and the highest dose. And, and so we're in t in incredibly focused on that, and we're also focused in a parallel, another parallel universe of trying to understand how we can estimate the day of infection. We need every possible tool to determine what day people got infected, because if we're off by a long period of time, we could call somebody infected at a time when antibody concentrations are far lower than we believe they are. That's the first point. The second point I would make is that it's not just about acquisition of infection. It's about preventing what are called sensitive viruses. If by the assays we use sensitive viruses are showing up at the highest concentration in the first four weeks, that's a problem for us. So we would like to see sieving or lack of sensitive viruses. And the third point is the challenge that was not obvious from Larry's slide. Larry showed these beautiful slides of quadrants um, and of animals where they're exposed and then they're protected and the titers are wonderful. We have no control over when humans have sex. We don't enroll people in our trial and say, would you mind having sex the day after the highest concentration of antibody? So I, I think that should be obvious. So we have these quadrants. We have no idea if anybody is sexually active anywhere near the quadrant. Um, and so one, one way this can go really wrong is what if the infusion is such that people feel they shouldn't have sex for a month after their infusion? I don't know if, Larry, you've thought about that carefully. But, uh, but we have no control over the human beha sexual behavior that, that the animal people, like Dan, have a lot of control over exposure and interpretation. And so as we're looking at a huge data set of 44,000 infusions and 7,000 homo sapiens, there is a big challenge to understanding what they did and the day they became infected. So um, on that note, I would, I would add that I think the people in this room are going to spend the next two days talking about what I think is really a great opportunity. We have challenges in the antiviral field that can be offset by the BNAB field, and there are a lot of BNABs available, and the BNABs are going to be in combinations. They can be delivered sub-Q, and I think the development platform is very robust from the people in this room. So it's an exciting thing, at least for the prevention trials network, to see these BNABs developed as, from our point of view, other alternative prevention agents for HIV-negative people for t the right population. And like Larry, I'll thank you for listening. I have to thank NIMH, NIAID, NI NIDA, uh, the Fogarty Center, and every other NIH institute, since we, and, and the Gates Foundation and every drug company on the planet. So, <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thanks for inviting me to talk. Thank you.